Once, not all that long ago, Pennsylvania was a wilderness. It was a land of wide mountains and deep valleys cut by fast rivers and covered in an almost solid blanket of hardwoods, pines, and hemlock. It was home to mountain lions, whitetails, and lynx, and black bears. And in those virgin forests lived the animal the Shawnee called the Wapiti, and which the settlers called elk moving through the dark woods like ghosts, their bugling calls echoing off the mountains every autumn. But through ignorance and greed, this treasure was lost more than a century ago, and the hills fell silent. Thanks to a few far-sighted conservationists, elk were brought back to Pennsylvania in the years before World War I. The history of these transplants has been rocky, and in the 1930s, we came within a whisker of losing them a second time. But after decades of protection and research, this easternmost elk herd in North America is thriving, growing rapidly in numbers and expanding, with some help from us, into parts of the state where they haven't been seen in any numbers since before the Civil War. This is an exciting time for the elk of Pennsylvania's Allegheny Mountains, and for all of us who thrill to the sight and sound of them in the wild. There are many reasons why these elk are doing so well today. We've learned that large tracts of public land are crucial to their survival, providing high quality habitat with fewer conflicts between elk and people. We're working to enhance that land, including abandoned strip mines, reclaiming them for elk and other wildlife. Another key has been radio telemetry, which has been used to monitor elk since the early 1980s. With this technology, we've been able to monitor the movements of the entire herd, learning their home range, what habitats they need, what foods they prefer, monitoring bulls through the annual rutting season, pregnant cows right up until the time of birth, and newborn calves through the first two years of life. This research has allowed us to better manage this unique wildlife resource, ensuring that elk remain part of our natural heritage far into the future. Along the way, we've learned a lot about these incredible animals, and we'd like to share what we've discovered with you. Pennsylvania's elk herd, the only wild herd along the eastern seaboard, traditionally ranged over some of the most rugged terrain in the state, encompassing parts of Cameron and Elk counties in the state's north central mountains. This is Pennsylvania's big woods country, where small seasonal hunting camps are more common than permanent homes, and where deer, black bears, and turkeys together far outnumber the human residents. Much of the land is publicly owned in the form of state game lands, state forest, or state parks. The elk are a major tourist attraction, especially during the fall rutting season. Bugling bulls, spectacular fall foliage color, and lots of other wildlife draw thousands of people each year to the tiny village of Benazet in Elk County, considered the heart of Pennsylvania's elk country. The tourists bolster the regional economy but cause traffic tie-ups and other headaches for local residents, just as the elk themselves inflict crop damage on farmers in the area. Safeguarding the herd while minimizing conflicts with people is the responsibility of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, which manages the elk in cooperation with the State Bureau of Forestry, private landowners, and various conservation groups. The goal is to maintain a self-sustaining population in a wild, natural state for everyone's benefit. To do this, we and our partners manage habitat to attract elk to public land and to alleviate problems like crop damage on private land. We have fenced agricultural fields to exclude elk, purchased additional acreage for their management, and improved elk habitat on public and private holdings, 
projects that have increased the number of elk while keeping many of them on public land. But to understand the importance of elk today in Pennsylvania, you have to understand their history. In pre-colonial times, the entire state, from the Delaware River to the shores of Lake Erie, was elk country. In fact, elk were the most widespread big game animal in North America, found from the Pacific Coast and Western Canada across the Great Plains to Northern New York and the Southern Appalachians. Those found in Pennsylvania were Eastern elk, one of six subspecies, a form adapted to life in the hardwood forest, grassy river banks, and small meadows of the east. They may originally have been more common than the white-tailed deer in some places. There are records of large numbers of elk near what is now Philadelphia, for instance. But the highest numbers of elk seem to have been in the Allegheny Plateau of north central Pennsylvania, along remote drainages like the west branch of the Susquehanna and Clarion Rivers and the Cinnamahoney Creek, Kettle Creek, and Pine Creek. Elk are members of the deer family, and are second only to moose in size, with some bulls weighing up to 900 pounds. They're closely related to the red deer of Europe and Asia, all of which are now considered to belong to a single, widespread species. It is believed that elk first entered North America during the last ice age, crossing the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia into Alaska, then spreading south and east across the continent. The first white settlers had several names for these huge branch antler creatures. A few adopted the Shawnee Indian name Wapiti, meaning pale deer or white deer, while others, especially in colonial days in Pennsylvania, called them gray moose. The name that eventually stuck, however, was elk, which, just to make things confusing, was originally used in Europe for the animal we call moose. Whatever they called it, early immigrants to Pennsylvania hunted elk whenever they could for their hides and excellent meat. Elk quickly disappeared from the southeastern part of the state, and by 1750, they were considered rare outside of the northern mountains. A few lingered in the Poconos until the 1830s, and in the southwestern counties until the 1840s, but by the Civil War, habitat loss, unregulated subsistence shooting, market hunting had all but eliminated elk from the state. Exactly where and when the last eastern elk was killed in Pennsylvania is unclear. One tradition holds that the last was shot by a Seneca Indian named Jim Jacobs in 1867, not far from St. Mary's. Folklorist Henry W. Shoemaker, on the other hand, who collected old hunting tales at the end of the 19th century, believed the last elk died around 1877 in Center County. Regardless, by the end of the 1800s, the eastern subspecies was extinct, and the Pennsylvania mountains had lost one of their most remarkable inhabitants. Like the eastern elk, the Merriam elk of the southwest and Mexico became extinct near the end of the 19th century, leaving just four of the six subspecies still alive today. The small tule elk is found in parts of California, while the Manitoban elk is found in Saskatchewan and Manitoba in Canada. The rainforest of coastal Oregon and Washington support the Roosevelt elk, the largest and darkest surviving type, which may weigh up to 1,100 pounds. The most widespread subspecies, however, is the Rocky Mountain elk, found from British Columbia and south in the mountains to New Mexico. The elk we have in Pennsylvania today are Rocky Mountain elk, and the story of how they came to be here is one of hope, wildlife management, and a bit of good luck. By 1912, the protected elk herds in Yellowstone National Park and the Jackson Hole area of Wyoming were increasing rapidly, and the federal government was looking for places to send some of them to reduce the population. The following year, the Pennsylvania Game Commission purchased 50 Yellowstone elk at $30 apiece, while another 22 elk were obtained from a private game farm in the Poconos, a herd that may possibly have included some surviving eastern elk, although no one is certain. Two years later, in 1915, another 95 Yellowstone elk were brought in, 
and finally, in the 1920s, 12 elk from South Dakota were purchased and released. In all, 177 elk were transplanted to form the nucleus of a new Pennsylvania herd. The elk were released in 10 counties, as far east as Carbon and Monroe, as far south as Huntington and Blair. But the majority of them went to north central counties like Clinton and Clearfield. Ironically, only seven were released in Elk County, which is now the center of the state's elk range. Actually, I grew up and spent most of my life with elk. Uh, I saw my first elk when I was probably four years old. It was a cow elk right on up uh, Dents Run here. And as, as I grew older, I um, remember listening to old hunter's tales about deer and elk and bear and bobcats and all that sort of thing. Um, the elk were made, last native elk were killed off in the 1870s, but tales of the elk hunt still persisted into my days. And um, in 1913, the Game Commission reintroduced elk in Pennsylvania in, in several different uh, locations. And the conditions were uh, almost ideal for both elk and deer at the time. Uh, a short, almost all of the original timber had been cut off by uh, the early 1900s. The uh, area was further devastated by forest fires. And the Pennsylvania Department of Forestry was created to, uh, to control these fires and slowly they then began to uh, bring them under control. There was vast uh, areas of brush intermixed with uh, uh, clearings and small openings, scattered active farms, abandoned farms, and it was ideal for elk. The new herd began to grow in number and caused trouble for farmers who responded by shooting some of them. Poachers still took others. But by 1923, there were enough elk for the Game Commission to hold an annual hunting season in hopes of reducing the population and controlling crop damage. I'm sure when they first declared their season, there must have been five or 600 or, or perhaps even more. Uh, they were common in uh, different areas of the state, uh, Clearfield County, Clinton County, uh, uh, Potter County had elk. Uh, there was elk scattered throughout the state, and it was a, a popular local pastime. Many people come into the area specifically to hunt elk. It was an open hunt that ran from 1923 through 1931, requiring no special permit besides a general hunting license. In all, 98 bulls were harvested, and another 77 were known to have been killed illegally or for crop damage. The elk, which had slowly increased after initial releases, declined in number during the 1920s and disappeared once again from most of the places where they had been transplanted. There may have been too many pressures from people, hunting, poaching, and shooting for crop damage, but there may have been another invisible cause. Uh, elk became scarce, so they closed the season. No one really knew why, and uh, now we can speculate that uh, uh, perhaps a brain worm, a little parasite that infects the, uh, the nervous system and the brain of elk. While a brain worm doesn't generally harm white-tailed deer, which carry and spread the disease, it causes paralysis and eventual death in elk. Many of the western animals, having little resistance to it, died. This animal is showing signs of brain worm. Brain worm is a parasite caused by a meningeal worm. Now, white-tailed deer carry this parasite. It affects deer and elk, but is generally fatal to elk and generally not fatal to white-tailed deer. So this animal can be feeding along, and it actually picks up slugs and snails that are infected with brain worm. The slugs and snails get it from white-tailed deer droppings, and of course elk and deer live on the same area out here. So once this animal ingests that brain worm, you start to see uh, some outward symptoms. As that brain worm makes its way uh, through the spinal cord into the brain, the meningeal worm, it starts to do some damage and then as we can pick up those symptoms and signs that the animal has a brain worm, it's generally irreversible for that elk. By the late 1920s, elk had been eliminated from eight of the ten release counties and were found only in the mountains west of the driftwood branch of the Susquehanna. This 200 square mile area in Elk and Cameron counties, which has remained the only stronghold of the species in Pennsylvania, 
overlaps with the last recorded range of the native eastern elk. Perhaps only a coincidence of history, but more likely a result of the rugged, largely uninhabited terrain in this part of the state. They were certainly low in numbers uh, during the 1930s, and it's only uh, pure speculation on my part, but uh, I feel that there were never, uh, at the most, no more than two dozen elk in Elk and Cameron County uh, during the 1930s. There may have been as few as 12 or 15, but uh, they did manage to hang on. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, to me that they, that they did survive. Uh, I think that uh, or there were several reasons for this. Uh, uh, they were pretty much a forgotten species after the hunting season was closed and very few people realized there were any elk in, in Pennsylvania. The area was remote, that is, it was, the access was limited, uh, but there was ideal habitat, uh, large stands of aspen uh, in, with uh, small clearings, and so it was a good place for elk to live, and they were bothered very little by people except during the deer season. And then the local people, uh, I think, took a protective attitude towards the elk. In, in all of the, the years I live here, and I can't remember of a single hearing of a single elk being poached for food during, during the 1930s. The elk population began to recover very slowly in the 1940s and 50s, and to increase somewhat more rapidly in the 1960s when timbering operations provided them with browse and new regenerating stands of aspen, a favorite food. Also, following World War II, Strip mining began around Winslow Hill, once a quiet community of small farms where elk were rarely seen. While the habitat destruction from the mining was harmful to wildlife, once mine reclamation laws took effect and some of the old pits were recontoured and seeded with grass, they became prime feeding areas for elk. The population began to grow more rapidly, as did crop damage on farms in the elk range. In 1971, uh, the farmers in the St. Mary's area shot a number of bull elk. And believe me, there was a firestorm of protest. Uh, the state was called, the uh, Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry was, was almost forced to do something. In the first place, nobody knew how many elk we had. Uh, so a census was, we uh, had a, the first census or survey was, uh, took place in, in 1972. Prior to that, uh, the estimates ranged anywhere from 40 or 50 elk to as many as 400 or 500 elk. But uh, the first survey, we counted about 75 elk. In addition to the annual aerial survey, the Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry began to devote increasing time, money, and attention to elk management. Old abandoned strip mines from the 1940s, which had been a useless eyesores, had been reclaimed and revegetated creating ideal forage for elk, as well as nesting habitat for many other grassland species. And by fencing off sensitive agricultural lands, the number of elk shot for crop damage has dropped as well. Although they remain largely within a traditional core range in Cameron and Elk counties, the herd has increased in the past 25 years, dramatically so since the early 1990s. Thanks to new management techniques, there are more than 400 animals today. Now, elk management in Pennsylvania has entered an exciting new phase, with the Game Commission and its partners working to expand both the herd size and its range by moving elk east into new areas of the North Central Mountain. Today, unlike the past, elk are the focus of intensive year-round study. Many of the animals, including newborn calves, have been fitted with radio collars so the movements can be tracked, shedding light on many previously unknown aspects of their ecology and pinpointing the most important causes of mortality. At the same time, we have been struggling to balance the needs of elk with the expectations of humans, especially since the land over which the herd roams has many owners and is used for many purposes. State forests and state game lands make up 40% of the elk range, with timbering and farming common on private land that makes up the rest. Outdoor recreation like hunting, fishing, trapping, cross-country skiing, camping, and hiking are common throughout the elk range, which is also inhabited by thousands of other species of animals and plants whose requirements must be balanced with those of the elk.
Although elk are members of the deer family, they differ in many ways from white-tailed deer. Male elk, called bulls, stand about five feet tall at the shoulder and can weigh up to 900 pounds, more than four times the weight of a white-tailed buck. Their antlers sweep backwards, not forward like a deer's, with up to seven or more points to a side. The females or cows are smaller, averaging between three and 500 pounds and don't carry antlers. Elk less than a year old are known as calves. The Shawnee called elk pale deer because of their light tan bodies, but the head, neck, lower legs, and belly are quite dark. The most visible characteristic of an elk, though, is its pale cream-colored rump patch with a very short tail that is completely unlike the big white flag of a deer. And like a deer, the elk summer coat is thin and reddish in color. Elk are primarily grazers, feeding heavily on grasses and other herbaceous plants, which is why meadows and forest openings are so important for them. Deer, on the other hand, are browsers much of the year, preferring woody twigs and buds. But this isn't a hard and fast rule. Elk will browse, especially in the winter, and deer often graze in the spring and summer, but in Pennsylvania the two species rarely compete with one another for food. Unlike herds in the western mountains, which may travel 80 or 90 miles to find good winter habitat, Pennsylvania's elk do not migrate. Bulls have home ranges of more than 20 square miles, three times larger than cows, but small compared to western elk, and a reflection of the quality habitat in Pennsylvania. Elk are highly mobile and have been known to move up to 11 miles in a single night. On occasion, elk make long exploratory trips into new areas, but they usually return to their core range eventually. The annual cycle of the elk begins in spring, as the animals are coming out of the hardships of winter and facing a hurdle of a different kind the physiological challenge of raising calves, growing their summer coats, and producing enormous antlers. The rising temperature and moisture from melting snow encourage lush vegetation in open areas, and bulls and pregnant cows seek out high quality forage as soon as they can find it, pawing through dead thatch to uncover new growth. In Pennsylvania each spring, elk feed heavily on two cool season grasses, timothy and orchard grass, as well as sedges and early forbs. Finding good food is especially important to pregnant cows, which are entering their final trimester as spring begins. Their physical condition at this time of the year will determine whether or not they'll successfully give birth. We've found that if pregnant cows lose more than 17% of their body weight during the winter and early spring, the survival of their calves will be greatly reduced. A thin, weak cow will either abort the fetus or the calf will likely die before it's a month old. The mother and the previous year's calf stay together through the winter, but about two weeks before she's ready to give birth, the cow will drive the yearling away. It's a painful separation, and sometimes the youngsters take some convincing. We've seen cows rearing on their hind legs and lashing out at the calves to force them off. The yearling bull calves are beginning to grow the first set of antlers, usually spikes. The yearlings of both sexes generally follow a group of barren cows, Although if the newborn dies, its mother may readopt it for a while until the youngster becomes fully independent. The lengthening days of spring also signals changes among the bulls. While the largest males will have dropped their antlers by late February, the younger bulls shed their antlers from mid-March through early May. This antler was shed about an hour ago. In Pennsylvania, elk retained their antlers longer than a white-tailed deer. Now these antlers are cast generally beginning by the end of February and the older bulls will shed first. The younger bulls will shed antlers through March and into April. And we have seen spike bulls retain their antlers and shed right into May. Uh, the length of the photo period or the amount of daylight triggers the antler cast. So as the daylight increases in the springtime, the amount of a male hormone called testosterone decreases. Now as that hormone decreases, there's a cartilage that forms between a pedestal, which is on the elk skull, in the antler, and as the hormone decreases, it causes that cartilage to die, and the antlers are cast. Now, there's a period of about 10 to 14 days. Once the bull sheds his antlers, it allows for the pedestal to heal, and then he will begin new antler growth. The antlers of deer, including elk, are solid bone, and are the fastest growing animal tissue known to science. 
expanding by as much as an inch per day. As in whitetail, the new antlers are covered with the blood-rich skin called velvet that nourishes the growing bone. During this time, the elk are very careful not to bump the antlers because damage to the velvet can result in a deformed rack. The antler growing period for an elk is somewhat different than for deer. Buttons are rarely visible on male elk calves, but they are on six or seven month old whitetail fawns known as button bucks. In yearling elk, antler growth doesn't start until June or July and ends by mid-September, a period of about 90 days. As the elk gets older, his antlers will begin to grow earlier and earlier each spring, each year. A well-fed mature bull of five to 10 years old will start in mid-March and have fully grown antlers by late July or early August, a period of about 150 days. Once the antlers are fully grown, the elk cleans off the valid by thrashing and rubbing the rack against trees or shrubs. There is no mistaking this for a deer rub. Some elk rubs are more than seven feet high. Elk seem to prefer using conifers, and they may completely destroy trees that are four or five inches in diameter snapping off branches or the top. Unlike deer, antler points of an elk are counted on one side only. A bull with up to five points on a side is known as a raghorn. These males usually have high, narrow racks. A bull with six points on each side is referred to as a six by six or a royal. An imperial has seven points per side with a huge sweeping rack that may weigh 35 pounds or more. The size and shape of the antlers depends on a host of factors, including age, body size, the quality of the elk's diet, his reproductive status, and perhaps genetics. As May comes to a close, the cows, which are nearing the end of their eight and a half month pregnancy, prepare to give birth. As the time gets closer, the cow withdraws from the herd and gives birth by herself, perhaps to avoid attracting predators. Most calves are born during mid-June in Pennsylvania. As in western states, our elk almost always give birth to a single calf. Out of more than 140 births we've documented over seven years, only three cases of twins were recorded. The calf weigh about 30 pounds and can walk and run shortly after it's born. But calves don't always stay with their mothers at first. Instead, they use what's known as a hider strategy, the same as whitetail fawns. The newborn calf picks a hiding place, often in thick grass or ferns, and trusts its spotted camouflage to keep it hidden. Young calves are almost free of scent, and the cow eats the afterbirth and carefully licks the birthplace clean so there is no telltale odor to alert predators. The cow stays within sight of the calf's hiding place, joining it four to eight times a day to nurse, remove any urine or feces, and lick the calf thoroughly to eliminate odor. If the cow senses danger, she gives a sharp bark and may charge in to protect her baby, while the calf responds by dropping flat to the ground and freezing until its mother gives the all clear. Calves continue to use this hider strategy until they are 10 or 12 days old, after which they run off with the cow when there is danger. The first month of life is a crucial one for elk calves. One way that we have learned all this is by catching newborn calves and fitting them with special expandable radio collars designed to eventually drop off. We monitored 161 cows over a seven year period, on foot, in vehicles, and on horseback and we found that 68% of those cows put a live calf on the ground. Surviving female calves will first mate before they're two and a half years old and give birth the following spring as a three-year-old. Yeah, we're working on the calves for a uh, calf survival study. We're monitoring reproduction as well. And uh, we want to get a feel for uh, reproduction of our herd here in Pennsylvania. We're monitoring uh, radio instrumented cows. We uh, walk in on these cows during the calving season, see who's got a calf on the ground and who doesn't, and uh, we want to get a uh, annual recruitment rate, but also we want to go one step further and look at the, uh, the survival of those calves. So in order to do that, we've got to mark the calves, so we fit them with an expandable breakaway collar, 
expandable in that it's uh, made out of elastic material so it uh, expands with the growth of the animal. Breakaway in that it's got this cotton tab that uh, through time the elements, the rain, the snow, uh, ultraviolet rays uh, will uh, break that down and the collar will fall. It's designed to come off in about uh, 20 to 24 months. And the collars are equipped with a mortality sensor. In other words, we, uh, we can monitor the uh, animals just by listening to them with our telemetry equipment. And uh, we can tell whether the animal is alive or dead or it shed the collar just by listening to it on the air. So these collars beat at about 50 beats a minute when the animal is up and moving. So it's got a motion sensing switch in there. And if the animal uh, dies or it sheds this collar, it'll beat at 100 beats a minute. So instead of going beep, 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 it'll be beep, 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 beep. And we can tell that with our equipment. And uh, we move in right away and determine cause of death if we can. And if nothing else, determine the survival rate of the newborns. Based on what we've learned from our studies of cow reproduction and calf mortality, Pennsylvania's elk herd is pretty much in line with productivity of other wild elk herds, including Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Each year, about two-thirds of our cows give birth, and about 70% of those calves survive their first year of life. Of 30 calves we fitted with radio collars, seven were lost to bacterial infection, brainworm, winter mortality, drowning, and poaching. One was lost to a black bear, the only such case ever recorded in Pennsylvania, despite the state's high bear population and despite the presence of coyotes in the elk range, we've never found evidence of one killing a calf. This is in stark contrast to Wyoming, where black bears are the number one cause of death among elk calves, and coyotes are number two. The reason for the difference, we believe, lies in the food supplies available to Pennsylvania bears and coyotes. While both will take an elk calf if the opportunity arises, they aren't forced by hunger to target this one species. By July, the calves begin to gather into noisy, active nursery groups whose bleating can often be heard long before they're seen. One or two cows will watch the calves, babysitting in effect, while the other cows have a chance to feed, drink, or take a rest nearby. While a cow can easily identify her calf by its scent, the youngsters seem to have trouble finding their own mother in these herds, and mix-ups are common. Fed first on rich milk called colostrum and later on grass, the calves grow very quickly, becoming more and more independent with each passing week. And by winter, a six-month-old calf may weigh more than 250 pounds. A hungry adult elk can eat as much as 22 pounds of food per day. And if that is corn, wheat, oats, or some other farm crop, the losses to a farmer can be substantial. Some nights they, you could see them in the daylight before dark, they just make a beeline for the corn cribs, you know, they just, you know, won't even stop until they hit the corn cribs and then they'd work, work the outside edges and try to get the boards out of the cribs at night sometimes and it just made a mess and you get 50, 60 there, it's just like having another herd of cows there, that's a lot of animals. Crop damage has been a persistent problem ever since elk were first reintroduced to Pennsylvania. Farmers are permitted to legally shoot elk that are causing crop damage, and for many years, this was one of the leading causes of mortality in the herd, accounting for almost a third of all deaths. But recently, the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation have underwritten part of the cost of special deterrent fencing around hundreds of acres of farmland hardest hit by elk. The Game Commission tried different things. You know, we as farmers tried different things. We tried chasing them out of the fields. Uh, the Game Commission tried to carbide guns, and nothing seemed to work, so our only other alternative was to shoot them for crop damage. Since we've had the fence, we've had, uh, the first year we put it up, we had a couple cows get in that fence, and since then, we have no penetration at all. You know, just, you know, no penetration, no elk. Fencing, though effective, is only a short-term solution. To further reduce the problem of crop damage, the Game Commission and State Bureau of Forestry are improving habitat on public land, drawing the animals away from the private farms. The key to this approach has been reclaiming and enhancing old strip mined areas near Winslow Hill, now part of Game Lands 311, which were purchased in 1990. Late in the 1800s and early in the 1900s, people started to dig for the coal on Winslow Hill. Uh, it was a farming community on top of the hill, lots of small farms, lots of people, little one-room schoolhouses. 
And then to supplement their income, they, they found some coal and dug for that coal. As uh, coal became more important to the industries in Pennsylvania and to electric production, uh, strip mines came into being. And then Winslow Hill was an easy place to strip mine. There wasn't that much uh, ground covering the coal, so there were some pretty large strip mines done up here. Uh, the combination of all those strip mines and the old drift mines uh, led to some severe uh, habitat destruction, especially if you're looking at it from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, loss of soils. Back then, the regulations on mining were, were very lenient. You know, the fellows took out the coal and didn't even have to recontour the property and didn't save the topsoil. Probably in the 1950s, 1960s, there were more regulations uh, put on strip mine operations. And during that era, uh, a lot of evergreens were planted on these uh, mine spoils. And that led to some, some improvement in the cover. Uh, there still wasn't soil and there still weren't grasses being grown but at least now we had evergreen trees. And then in the 70s and 80s, uh, mine reclamation uh, came onto its own, where soil was being saved, uh, being re-spread over the mine sites and crops of grass, and even sometimes oats and winter wheat were grown on the site. Uh, this led to much better reclamation success and a much higher use by wildlife. It would have been nice for us to purchase these lands uh, before they were strip mined. Uh, elk management and wildlife habitat work would have gone a lot better. However, uh, due to the damage on the land, we were able to purchase it at low prices. And a lot of these uh, hills right around here uh, had absolutely no vegetation on them, uh, were bare mineral soils, uh, were causing water pollution, and not supporting much wildlife of any sort and people came up and used this area. It was private property. Some of them camped on it and, and were real nice people and then other people used it as a motocross type of area, four-wheelers, motorcycles. So the combination of a poor habitat and uh, overrun with motor vehicles led to very little wildlife using this area. Uh, when you take those mixtures now of evergreens, uh, alder bushes, uh, some natural aspens growing, and then you take the grasses that are planted and maintained uh, you have some pretty good wildlife habitat. Not as good as if you had the original soils and the clean waters, but much improved over the unreclaimed uh, mines of the past. Along with uh, upgrading the uh, reclaimed sites, uh, we also added some areas of new seeding. Uh, what I'm saying is the reclaimed sites had mostly grasses, orchard grass, timothy, and other mine reclamation grasses. So then our crews came in and disked up those sites and we put in clovers, uh, ladino clover, um, all site clover, and white dutch clover mixed with uh, some winter wheat in the fall or some oats in the spring. And once you put those types of seedings in, uh, the wildlife usage goes way up. Uh, that's like putting a cake out there for the animals. They loved it. So we added these new seedings on approximately 20 to 30 acres of this game lands and there's times now we see 80 to 100 elk using some of these fields. So the new seedings mixed in with the uh, well-maintained old reclaimed sites are really paying off. The grasslands that cover these old mine sites are important, not only for elk, but for a variety of other animals. Deer graze here, and turkeys and rough grouse feed on grasshoppers. Foxes, coyotes, and hawks hunt for mice. Many species of grassland birds, including bobolinks, meadowlarks, and grasshopper sparrows, nest in these man-made meadows. The Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry has been an active partner with the Game Commission in managing public land for the benefit of elk and other wildlife. By creating regenerating clear cuts, grassy openings, healthy stands of aspen, and by thinning red oak stands to promote heavy acorn crops a favorite food for elk. In this area, we have about 50,000 acres of state forest land in the primary elk range. The type of work that we're doing here is geared to not only attracting animals from areas where there may be conflicts with people and other land uses, but not only to attract them, but also to hold them. And we're doing that primarily through habitat manipulation and again this 
focuses primarily on herbaceous openings and creating a brush stage forest and also trying to maintain and enhance the red oak component of the forest that we do have. Without a large public land base in this part of the Elk Range, that would be very difficult to do. We've always had a very good working relationship with the people from the Game Commission, primarily on the, on the field level where people like myself, foresters, and the other people in the uh, maintenance districts on the state forest work very well with people from primarily the Food and Cover Corps. We oftentimes have the land that's available for creating herbaceous openings, but we don't always have the manpower and the necessary equipment to do the work. And that's where the Game Commission comes in in the spirit of cooperation. There's still a lot of habitat work to be done to make north central Pennsylvania even better habitat for elk and other species. On one unreclaimed site in State Game Lands 311, where mining had left bare almost toxic mineral soil, the Game Commission tried an experimental technique to restore it. One of the better reclamation projects that has occurred on this game lands was a combination of work between Pennsylvania Game Commission, uh, the Johnsonburg Paper Mill, uh, the Soil Conservation Service, and the County Conservation District. There was about a 14-acre site that hadn't been reclaimed. It was stripped in the early 80s. The topsoil had been stored off to the side of the site that had never been respread or reclaimed. Uh, so with the assistance with the paper mill, we uh, respread the topsoil, and then we added a soil additive to it. Uh, Johnsonburg Paper Mill, one of their waste products, is uh, it looks like a white, wet cardboard. And it's very high in lime content. So we brought that down to the site, uh, chisel plowed it into the soil, disked the site up, and then reseeded the site with the uh, reclaimed soil plus the additive. Uh, that site has come back beautiful. Uh, for years and years it sat there. It was washed out gullies, uh, bare stones, uh, causing iron and sulfur to go into the local streams. And if you go look at the site today, it's a bright, bright green. And I've seen as high as 40 elk on the site, uh, over 30 deer using the site, sometimes 20 or 30 turkeys using the site. Through the summer, as the cows care for their calves, the bull elk are living in bachelor herds, feeding heavily. They need the food because growing a set of antlers takes roughly as much energy as raising a calf. Shortly after the antlers harden and are rubbed clean, generally by mid-August, the bulls begin sparring, locking antlers, and engaging in shoving matches that determine dominance, and thus the right to breed. Sparring matches usually take place between bulls of similar age and size, and although they are impressive to watch, serious injuries are rare. The rut, as the annual mating season is known, is announced by the bugle of the bulls, a thrilling, hair-raising sound unlike anything else in nature. This marks the beginning of a period of intense, dramatic activity, the time of the year when the winners of the reproductive game will be separated from the losers, and elk put all they have into being winners. In Pennsylvania, 40 branched antler bulls for every 100 cows has been documented, an extremely high number of bulls compared to some western states, and a ratio that sparks intense competition between the males. This competition ensures that only the very strongest, fittest bulls pass on their genes. 
Just as the lengthening days of spring trigger the growth of new antlers, the shorter days of late summer and autumn bring on the rut. For the bulls, autumn means higher levels of testosterone, a male hormone that, among other things, makes them more aggressive. The cows also experience hormonal changes that bring them into estrus. Because the photo period changes at a predictable rate each year, the timing of the rut is also predictable, and timing is crucial. If a cow ovulates and mates too early, her calf will die in the cold and storms of late winter. If she mates too late, her calf will be born after the peak period for many nutritious plants, and it won't grow quickly enough to survive the winter. Likewise, a bull that enters the rut too early will squander his fat reserves before most cows are ready to be bred. By starting in late August and September, the timing of the rut ensures that most calves will be born when conditions are ideal for their survival in late May through mid-June of the following year. Unlike many other members of the deer family, the rut in elk is based on male advertisement, and this is reflected in almost every aspect of a bull's life. Large, symmetrical antlers are a visual clue to cows that he is healthy and well-fed since crooked, deformed antlers grow on sick, injured, old, or parasitized bulls. The piercing high-pitched bugle carries over long distances to advertise the bull's presence, and as grunting tells cows and potential rivals how big he is, the deeper the grunt, the bigger the bull. During the chuckle at the end of the bugle, the bull's belly twitches and he sprays himself with urine, helping to create a distinctive rut scent that broadcasts his readiness to mate. Big, powerful, confident bulls horn trees, spray urine, and wallow in mud, while intimidated subordinate males who have lost sparring matches do not, and will have little or no chance to breed. Elk are polygamous animals, meaning that one bull will mate with as many cows as possible. He can do this two ways, by seeking out individual females, or by advertising himself through bugling and displays to attract a group of cows, known as a harem. Once a so-called herd bull has collected a harem, it is a full-time job to keep them. If he doesn't keep advertising and displaying, he may lose the cows to a rival. He may also move the cows to open fields, a strategy to better keep an eye on them. A bull herds the cows in his harem constantly, keeping them together until they are ready to mate, circling with his head thrown back to block any female that tries to escape. A cow that doesn't obey his signal to rejoin the harem may be charged and gored. The bull will periodically test the cows for sexual receptivity. Obviously, though, he can't use the same body language as he uses for herding. Instead, he approaches directly from the rear, with his neck and antlers raised to show his peaceful intentions. If the cow isn't willing to be courted, she'll lower her head and weave and twist it from side to side as she opens and closes her mouth rapidly. This is her signal to the bull to stop, and he will, generally turning away to bugle. The more successful a bull is at gathering a harem, the more likely he'll also attract rivals. Competing bulls will show off, trying to intimidate each other into quitting rather than fighting. They'll trot side by side, spraying urine and thrashing trees with their antlers. But a harem is worth fighting for, and true dominance fights, while rare, are violent. Unlike sparring earlier in the season, serious injuries are common in these battles. The charging bull is met by the lowered antlers of its rival, and whichever male loses must escape quickly, because in turning to run, he exposes his side to attack and possibly fatal wound. A bull that loses his footing during a fight will probably be gored to death, and we know of several males that have died in Pennsylvania from wounds suffered during dominance contests. Each year, the autumn rut attracts growing numbers of tourists to north central Pennsylvania, drawn by the sights and sounds of this annual spectacle. Most of the visitors descend on the village of Benazette in Elk County and to nearby Winslow Hill, where a special viewing area has been constructed. While the influx of tourists bring much needed income to this part of Pennsylvania, the crowds present problems for both the elk and for local residents. 
we had 3,000 people on Winslow Hill. Our population is 243 in all of Benezet Township, so that's a lot of, that's an immense amount of people. Small road system, uh, traffic is blocked. Three lanes of traffic, you can't get to Benezet, from Benezet, uh, you actually can't get anywhere. It's frustrating to try to go to work. It starts at seven o'clock in the morning and ends at dark that uh, you can't get to work, you can't get home. You're fighting with people you don't even know because you're in a hurry to get somewhere or maybe you just want to go for a drive but you can't get out of your driveway. Well, every weekend we have a lot to look forward here in Benazette. Used to be before the Alk became so prominent, Claire would say, you know, Loretta, there hasn't been not one car down by our house tonight. That was in the old days, but now, Come Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, it's a steady stream. Just one car after the other. That's how many tourists visit here. But the people, the people will just, they try to run up to them and get close, and it's frightening to see. Uh, one time we saw a man that uh, they were trying to feed the elk out of their hand, and he had a small child, and he tried, he lifted the child up to put him on the back of this bull elk. And, and the bull turned his head and, and, and the guy got the child off just fast enough that, that the, the child didn't get hurt, but it could have been a bad situation. People don't realize that they're a wild animal and that you, sh you are not permitted to feed them and should not try. I think it's very important to educate the people. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, we want the people to come. Um, the elk are beautiful, we, we'd like to share them, we'd like for people to see them, but obey just common sense, pull off the roadway. Um, if you're going to leave your vehicle pulled off the roadway and shut all the doors and turn it off. Uh, if you're near private property, ask permission. You know, most people will allow you to take pictures or walk or whatever. Uh, don't drive on people's property, it's common sense. Dominant bulls have little time for feeding during the rut, and large herd bulls will lose a lot of their weight during the four to six week mating period. As the rut begins to fade and most of the cows have been bred, the exhausted bulls start to recover by feeding intensively, often grazing long after sunrise to recoup depleted fat reserves before winter. Spike bulls rejoin family groups, and large herds of elk can be seen after the rut. Bulls usually form bachelor herds, although if one encounters a cow that wasn't bred, he may stay with her family group until she comes into estrus again. This lower level of mating activity occurs in mid to late October, but by November the rut is completely finished. For the bulls, that's the end of all reproductive activity until the following August, but the cows, which must nurture their developing embryos through the long, difficult winter, are carrying the future of the herd within them. As for most wildlife, winter is the season of greatest challenge for the elk. In the rugged mountains of north central Pennsylvania, winter can be especially brutal with sub-zero temperatures, ice storms, deep snow, and howling winds. This is also the season when they can be most easily stressed by human disturbance. Elk prepare for winter by laying on plenty of fat and by growing a thick coat of hollow hair that traps air and insulates the elk efficiently. The rumen, Part of the elk's multi-chambered stomach undergoes changes as well to help it digest the rough, coarse food they find in midwinter. And the elk's metabolism slows down in midwinter as well, reducing the energy needed to maintain its body temperature. The elk at this time of the year can seem sluggish and lethargic, and they'll often bed down with their heads resting on the ground to conserve energy. Our elk aren't migratory but they do tend to shift from upland areas to lowland drainages and to the sunnier south sides of mountains where there is more protection from snow and wind. Conifers are extremely important to elk during cold weather since the temperature inside a thick pine or hemlock stand
can be as much as 15 degrees warmer than outside, and the snow is often not as deep. Elk also use conifers in summer heat because at that time of the year the shady forests are cooler. Because elk are very sensitive to disturbance in winter, the large roadless tracts of land in some sections of state forests and state game lands are crucial to them. Elk that are repeatedly disturbed by motor vehicles, especially snowmobiles, waste a lot of energy, and if they're stressed often enough, they may not make it through the winter. Elk continue to graze through the winter using their powerful front legs to dig down through as much as 15 or 20 inches of snow to reach grass or acorns. Surprisingly, an elk is more of a generalist in its diet than a whitetail, especially in winter, when it can even subsist on old, decaying vegetation that would not support a deer. Deer and turkeys often follow grazing elk, taking advantage of the food they uncover. But when the snow gets too deep, or is crusted with ice, the elk move into the timber to feed. This is a sign that elk have been feeding on this witch hazel tree. Now even though elk are primarily considered a grazing animal, a wintertime activity is called barking. And elk will use their incisors on their lower jaw, and with an upward motion, they will peel the cambium layer from these trees. They do prefer witch hazel, but also aspen, red maple, and ironwood. Elk generally prefer to bark smooth bark trees. Winter is especially tough on the very young and the very old, and the oldest elk we've recorded in Pennsylvania is 19 and still living. Calves are also more susceptible during winter than prime-aged elk of between 2 and 10 years old because their small size makes it harder for them to move through deep or crusted snow. Calves are also low in social ranking, so they're often forced away from the best food source, resulting in less stored fat and thinner winter coats. One reason we know so much about mortality in elk is because we use radio telemetry to follow the movements of collared animals. Some elk are given radio collars as calves, but to get a good cross-section of the herd, we also have to capture adult bulls and cows. Okay, we just shot a dart into this bull. He should go down in about five minutes, and we're going to approach him from the back side. The fast-acting drug begins to affect the bull's coordination and balance normally within two minutes. During the first two minutes, the bull may shake his head or his entire body as his muscles become weaker. As his muscles weaken, the hindquarters gradually lower to the ground and the bull lowers to the sternal position. Finally, the bull is unable to hold his head up and will roll onto his side. Another few minutes are necessary until the bull is completely immobilized and can be safely handled. First thing we do when we approach the animal is monitor the vital signs, the heartbeat and respiration. We want to make sure that animal is in a safe condition during the entire capture. The blindfold is placed on there to uh, reduce stress on the animal. So then we'll ear tag the animal, we'll age the animal by looking at worm replacement of his teeth, we'll take some measurements from his neck, his girth, total length, antler measurements, and we'll fit him with a radio collar. We're going to fit this radio collar on this bull. It will allow us to monitor his movements for the next three to five years. And from the ground, we're able to monitor his locations with our telemetry equipment out to about two and a half to three miles. And from an airplane, we can get out to about five miles. From radio telemetry data, field observations, and other research, we've tracked elk mortality rates and causes since the 1970s. On average, in the 1990s, about 20 elk die each year, with vehicle collisions the single biggest cause of death, a change from past years when poaching and shooting for crop damage accounted for two-thirds of all known deaths. Brainworm and other diseases, malnutrition, accidents, and calf predation all contribute to the mortality rate.
Yet despite all these pressures, Pennsylvania's elk population has risen steadily over the years, and particularly since the late 1980s. By the late 1990s, the state's elk population was more than 400 animals. Coming up with a population estimate takes lots of manpower and flight time. Except in years when there isn't enough snow cover, we conducted a midwinter aerial survey of the elk range every winter since 1971, counting the large dark animals from planes and helicopters. Teams of pilots and observers fly pre-range transect routes, counting the elk they see against the snow. By taking the number of radio colored animals the spotters see and comparing it to the number of elk we know we marked earlier in the year, we can calculate how many elk were missed during the survey and come up with a reasonably accurate estimate of the total elk population. Telemetry antennas attached to a fixed wing plane are used to locate each radio colored elk prior to helicopter flights. Each radio colored elk's location, sex, and age is recorded by an observer in the plane. This information, however, is not given to helicopter crews until transect flights are completed. Helicopter crews fly transect routes 300 feet above this rugged terrain at 55 to 65 mile per hour, counting all the elk they see. Crews record the number of branched antler bulls, spike bulls, cows, and calves, and how many were radio collared. After transect flights are completed, crew members from the plane and helicopter compare the number of radio collared elk known to be in the area with the number actually observed. Occasionally, elk are missed by helicopter crews. We've learned that large groups of elk are more conspicuous than smaller groups, and that elk that are moving are easier to see than elk that are standing or bedded. Elk that use dense cover such as pine, hemlock, and mountain laurel are very difficult to see, and at times virtually impossible to observe. From the helicopter, using radio telemetry, we have actually tracked radio colored elk into dense hemlock cover and were still unable to sight the group. The number of radio colored elk seen and missed during aerial surveys provide valuable information necessary to estimate the herd size. It isn't a perfect system and we know that some elk outside the primary range are missed, but the aerial survey is our best tool for determining whether or not the herd is increasing and by how much. Managing Pennsylvania's elk herd is a difficult task because the elk touch on so many different human constituencies and interest groups and because the elk's requirements must be balanced against those of many other species of native wildlife. Elk management must take into account the needs of local landowners, including farmers whose crops and orchards are damaged by feeding herds. Any management plan must consider the remarkable popularity of elk watching and the revenue that tourism brings to the local and regional economy. It may require the temporary closing of backcountry access roads and snowmobile trails to protect wintering elk, or the acquisition of crucial pieces of habitat to add to the public land base. It has implications for forest and grassland management, economic development, hunting, and other forms of outdoor recreation. For more than a generation, elk have been a powerful symbol of wilderness and a reminder of Pennsylvania's frontier heritage. They add immeasurably to the wild character of the North Central Mountains and are a magnificent example of the state's natural diversity. If they're to continue to thrive in the next century, they'll require careful stewardship based on solid science and increasing cooperation between public agencies, private conservation groups, and local property owners. One conservation group that has been especially important has been the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a Montana-based group with thousands of members in Pennsylvania. Reasons that people are more aware of elk today is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. This is a, a private, non-profit conservation group based in uh, Missoula, Montana, but they have provided much funding for elk projects in Pennsylvania, for, for fencing, for land management, land acquisition, and research, and probably more importantly, they have focused attention on elk. Well, the RMEF was founded in 1984 by four gentlemen out of western Montana, 
They saw what other organizations like Ducks Unlimited, National Wild Turkey Federation were doing, and they recognized no one was doing anything for elk. So they put their heads together, and nearly 15 years later, who would have thought that we'd be a, an international organization with 110,000 active members? Um, they summed up the role of the organization with a simple mission statement, and that says, uh, to ensure the future of elk and other wildlife by conserving, restoring, and enhancing their natural habitats. Surprisingly, a good deal of the money we raise is generated east of the Rocky Mountains in states like Pennsylvania. Right now we have over 6,000 members in Pennsylvania and 16 active chapters. Well, we're fortunate to be able to fund a number of projects in Pennsylvania, including land acquisition like State Game Lands 311, habitat enhancement projects on both uh, state game lands and Bureau of Forestry lands, and other projects like the trap and transfer and the public elk viewing area, and a number of other conservation education programs in Pennsylvania. In the years after the Depression and World War II, few people outside of Elk and Cameron counties gave the tiny elk herd much thought. But in the last decade, as the herd has grown rapidly, the elk have had an increasing impact on people. Those impacts can be good or bad, depending to a large degree on human attitudes and actions. It's thrilling to have a wild elk feeding at the edge of your yard, but some people aren't content with that. Even though it's illegal, some people still put out corn, apples, or hay to keep elk around for easy viewing. But artificial feeding is bad for both elk and people. Disease transmission is more likely at feeders, but most importantly, feeding results in elk with little fear of humans, setting up a potentially dangerous situation, especially if it involves large, naturally aggressive bulls in the rut, and visitors who don't know enough to give elk a wide berth. Uh, as more and more people come into the areas and have contact with elk, there certainly has been all sorts of, all sorts of uh, problems, and this is only made worse by people feeding elk and, uh, and in effect they're semi-domesticating the animals. Uh, I can't uh, see where we can ever completely overcome that problem, but we, we, something has to be done to separate elk and people. And that in itself is more of a, uh, it's more of a people problem than an elk problem as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to be uh, seriously injured or, or, or killed by one of these animals. And then the elk will be blamed for it when it's actually, actually a people problem. These are wild animals, although they may appear to be uh, tame. They're still wild animals, and they should be treated as such. Well, there's two things going on. First of all, the, the artificial feeding has stopped, and uh, the elk are wandering around looking for food, but uh, even more important what's going on, we've had a cool, dry spring, and the animals are coming off the plateaus, off the mountaintops, into the bottoms, and they're working on this green grass. And these lawns are the greenest grass around right now, and that's what's attracting them down in here. We gotta go push them out of there. In addition to putting a stop to illegal elk feeding, one technique that works is firing harmless shell crackers at habituated elk around people's homes. If this is done repeatedly, the elk soon learn to avoid backyards. Sometimes even these methods don't work, and elk must be moved into more remote locations. Bull elk occasionally visit the small village of Weedville in the southwestern corner of the range in search of food, and at times create public safety problems. When hazing techniques are either not practical or ineffective, 
we must accelerate our efforts to minimize possible injury to residents and elk. In some cases, these animals must be immobilized and moved away from town. Immobilizing a bull in a residential area presents additional man-made hazards for elk. From the time the bull has been darted until he is immobilized is the most critical time. As the drug begins to affect the bull's coordination, we must contain him in a safe area, away from highways and other hazards. Once the bull is down, we monitor his heart and respiration. Okay, we had some nuisance elk here in the village of Weedville. They were kind of marauding through town here, raiding bird feeders uh, close to the highway, close to the houses. And it's uh, kind of a nuisance situation, plus it also prevents a public safety problem. So we immobilized this bull, and the very first thing we did was remove his antlers, because if you're an elk, uh, that's kind of his status in the population. So not only does it protect the handlers while we're handling the bull, but it also removes any aggression the bull might have and he'll associate a negative uh, situation with people, which he's been pretty used to people. So we're going to saw those antlers off as we did, which removes any aggression he might have. We're going to load him on a trailer. This technique has been used in western states and Canada with some success. In Pennsylvania, by fitting these bulls with radio collars and monitoring their movements, we have learned that 60% of all nuisance bulls relocated did not return. If bulls were relocated less than 20 miles from town, they will likely return. But if relocated greater than 23 miles, most did not. For most of this century, the elk herd remained small, increasing slowly or not at all. But thanks to better land management, intensive research, and changing public attitudes that have reduced poaching and crop kills, the herd has been growing rapidly in recent years. The population has been rising at a rate of 12 to 14 percent a year. And if that trend continues, we might expect the herd to reach 900 by 2005 and almost 1600 by the year 2010. There simply isn't enough room for all these elk in the traditional range in Elk and Cameron County. While they've expanded into the new places on their own, like the 50,000 acre Quihanawad area in Clearfield County, there is a danger that the elk might begin moving into more heavily populated farming regions west of their traditional range, bringing them into greater conflict with people. At the same time, there's a tremendous amount of public land across the northern tier counties east of the traditional range that would be ideal for elk, land with few people, virtually no farming, and no interstate highways. So the Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry, with support and technical advice from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and several universities, have embarked on an exciting trap and transfer program designed to transplant elk into some new areas, greatly expanding the range and allowing the herd to grow safely. After a careful review of possible sites statewide, the location chosen for the initial release was in western Clinton County in part of the 289,000 acre Sproul State Forest, which because of adjacent tracts of state land was well suited for the attempt. The first 33 elk were released in the spring of 1998. If all goes as planned, this should quadruple the elk's range in the state from roughly 200 square miles to more than 800 and serve as a launching pad for natural dispersal into still other areas of public land in north central Pennsylvania. That will act as a safety net, in a way, spreading the elk over a larger area so that environmental factors and human impacts pose less of a danger to the population as a whole, and re-establishing elk in areas that once supported them. To capture the animals, a portable corral trap was erected in areas where elk populations have been high, 
and where conflicts with farmers have been common. The trap is designed to reduce stress on the elk and to keep their contact with humans to a bare minimum during capture, processing, and transfer. Along with the Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Penn State University, Frostburg State University in Maryland, and Purdue University in Indiana all provided technical support and funding to make the transfer a reality. I uh, am the conservation programs manager for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. That means I get to coordinate all the projects nationwide that the Elk Foundation is involved in. My role here uh, comes from my previous career well, with Wyoming Game and Fish Department. I was with them for 24 years, and the last 20 years of that were in Jackson Hole, so I had a wonderful opportunity to handle an awful lot of elk. Uh, one of the things that we were able to provide is, is the blueprints for the portable trap. At first they were going to do a permanent trap, and we started talking about the, the uh, nice uh, handling features of a portable trap, and we can move the trap to wherever the elk were, rather than trying to get the elk where the trap was. So. I prefer corral trapping uh, to the use of drugs. Uh, number one, if you're looking for large sample sizes, it's, it's much more efficient. I think it's also uh, pretty easy on the elk. The main purpose of my trip out here now is to actually uh, help the Pennsylvania Game Commission and, and their partners to learn how to work elk standing up and going through a corral trap. It's really exciting. Uh, a lot of people were real worried about how elk would react. Uh, everybody in Pennsylvania uh, in the wildlife profession has handled white-tailed deer and they know they're very difficult to handle and they thought it would just be mag magnified three or four or five times because an, uh, an elk is that much bigger than a white-tailed deer. And I'm here to let them know that an elk's by far the easiest animal to handle of all the North American game animals. This is a portable corral trap. It's used extensively in the western elk states, actually designed in the state of Montana. We received the plans here in Pennsylvania and built this trap for use on our elk range expansion project. The idea being by trapping elk, the trap itself is portable so we can be flexible into a number of different locations. By trapping family groups of elk, by getting the adult cows, the yearlings and the calves, they're more likely to stay at the release site then and of course expand the elk range. So this trap has uh, got a large corral there about 48 feet in diameter. There's a, a gate in the opening. We can bait that gate with uh, alfalfa and corn, get the animals on the inside, and then we close that gate. We can then work them into a smaller holding corral and then down into what we call working chutes, which is where we can confine their movements and that's where we collect our data. We capture the elk in a portable corral trap and the, the large corral is 48 feet in diameter, it's circular. And we push the elk into a small holding corral, which is right here behind me. It's only about 15 feet diameter. And then the idea is to work these elk down these working chutes. It's like an escape route for them. We want them to come down here and feel they're going to be safe. Now, these working chutes are 20 inches wide, 6 feet long, and 6 feet high. And we get them in here, and this is where we can collect our data. And the neat thing about working elk is you can actually calm this animal down by stroking them nice and softly on the neck. Talk to them in a real nice, uh, light tone of voice. You can actually calm animals, and it's kind of neat to think about that because a wild animal such as an elk has never been touched before by a human but this will actually calm that animal. We blindfold each animal, would actually reduce the stress on that animal. So it makes the whole processing easier on that animal and it makes handling the animal much easier for us too. So while they're in the chutes, we're gonna ear tag each animal for identification. We're gonna put radio collars on them for monitoring movements and, and habitat preference. Uh, we're gonna draw blood from each animal for genetics and uh, bruce brucellosis and um, we're going to be getting a sex and an age on each animal as well. The whole process takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes and when we're all done, and keep in mind we don't use drugs at all during this entire process, and when we're done we'll just raise the doors, these elk will move right on into the trailer. They feel very secure in that trailer. It's a nice dark place and uh, a lot of times they even lay down in that trailer. Once they've been tagged, collared, and processed, the elk are loaded onto a trailer and move 30 to 40 miles over the mountains to the release site a three and a half acre holding pen on state forest land, surrounded by good grazing areas. After several weeks in the pen, the elk are allowed to leave in early spring when fresh forage is appearing. We follow the elk's movements using radio telemetry to keep track of them. Eventually, we hope that elk will spread into other parts of Pennsylvania's northern plateau where they've long been absent. 
increasing the biological diversity and giving more outdoors men and women a chance to see this incredible animal in the wild. Some parts of the state, however, simply aren't suitable for elk because of dense human populations, highways, and agriculture. Unlike deer, which can thrive in small patches of forest, elk require at least 200 square miles of suitable habitat in order to survive. Elk were originally reintroduced to Pennsylvania to permit a hunting season, although that season has been closed since 1932. Given the herd's rapid growth in recent years, it could currently support a limited hunt, but our agency felt it was a better management decision to expand the elk's range and the size of the population instead. But despite the larger range, the time may be approaching when the hunt will be necessary to manage the herd. If the population is allowed to rise unchecked, the elk will eventually degrade the very habitat on which they depend, bringing them into conflict with people, deer, and other wildlife species. Unlike the hunts held in the 1920s, which were open to anyone with a general hunting license, any modern hunt would be very strictly controlled with only a handful of permits issued. Removing a small number of elk each season would not negatively affect the health of the herd or its overall growth. In fact, by removing mature animals, a hunt could help the population as a whole by freeing up resources for younger, more productive elk. There are no plans for a hunt near the most popular elk viewing areas, which are home to a small herd of elk that have become accustomed to people. The vast majority of the state's elk live in remote areas and are wild animals that would provide an extremely challenging hunt. Whatever decisions are made for the future of the elk, they won't be made without public input. All wildlife, including elk, are a public resource and their management must take into account the values and opinions of all Pennsylvanians, not just hunters or landowners. In fact, that's part of the state's official elk management goal, to preserve a free-ranging herd for both viewing and unique hunting opportunities at population levels compatible with the habitat on public and private land. The Game Commission, Bureau of Forestry, and our conservation partners are committed to helping the elk prosper into the 21st century through habitat enhancement, management based on solid science, and through land acquisition that helps safeguard crucial feeding, wintering, and calving areas. One thing's for sure, the days when elk were a forgotten species are over. More and more people, rural and urban alike, recognize that these great animals add tremendously to the wilderness character of Penn's Woods and people seem to be increasingly willing to make the small changes and sacrifices necessary to coexist with elk. The elk cannot change. Elk are wild, living in the way nature intended. It's our responsibility to learn to live with them. Elk are certainly one of the most interesting animals that we have. And to hear an elk, a bull elk bugle, close up is certainly an awesome and even terrifying experience. And better yet, uh, perhaps uh, to have two bull elk brawl in your backyard at midnight, even if they do tramp down the apple trees and uh, uh, destroy my wife's flower garden. Uh, we always got to keep in mind that, that uh, if we want the elk here, we're going to have to learn to share the land with them. I think that the uh, future of the elk is secure now. That's something that I wouldn't have uh, said 25 years ago. The elk of Pennsylvania's Allegheny Mountains are survivors. They've survived long periods of neglect, and now they're adapting to a rapidly changing world, moving out of their mountain stronghold to reclaim new parts of the state. They are a reminder of our ancient past and a unique natural resource for the future. If we all work together, we can ensure that the Elks Bugle echoes off the ridges of Pennsylvania for many generations to come.